Hi everybody. Well, as a lot of you know, I've been doing photography now for about 14 or 15 years. I did do it semi-professionally at one point. It's one of the reasons I have some of the pro gear that I have. Um, but people ask me what camera and lens do I use, and I thought, well, I might as well do a video on all the equipment that I use, all the little bits and pieces, and I'd also show you the evolution of the cameras as I learned photography. Now, the first camera I used would have been one of those little plastic, you know, spin wheel click cameras. Um, but that's, that's not really photography, you don't have any control over that. Um, and it was with this camera I'm about to show you now, which was the first proper camera I had, is where I learned my trade, or well, it's not my trade at all, <laughs> but you know, but it is where I learned the basics of photography. So the first camera was a Casina. I've never heard of this company, I might be saying that wrong, the name, um, but I basically bought this off my brother, because my brother got it and decided photography wasn't really for him. So I bought it off him for 50 quid many, many years ago, and this is, say, where I learned all my basics. So it's a Casina CT4, 35 millimeters, obviously. Uh, door opens like this, like lots of the cameras did back then. What else we got on here? The, oh, I do love the old ratchet arm. It's just so satisfying. And the click, just lovely. Uh, it, it has got an auto mode, but I did learn how to use manual on this. This is where I learned the basics. Uh, aperture adjustment, very stiff focus. This was a, this is a 50mm lens. I only ever had one lens for this camera. I don't know what fit it actually is, technically. But that, for me, is where it all began. And I'm, I'm really glad, actually, that I still have all the cameras I learned with, because it's, uh, it's nice to have these things as years go by. So I used this camera for probably a year or two, uh, and then I decided I was really enjoying photography and I needed to get something a bit more up to date. This was a long time ago though, so more up to date was still 35mm. <laughs> this is a Canon 50E, again, 35mm. Uh, I believe this camera is about £800 brand new, uh, but I actually got it off my uncle. I paid him about, about £200 for it at the time. It came with a lens that I'll show you later on, but it came with a kit lens, which I still use today, even on digital stuff. But anyway, back to the 50E. It's basically the same thing, there isn't a lot more to it. Um, it's still a 35mm camera, it's got a few more controls. The only great advancement between the old one and this one was the fact that this had a drive mode, so it could take something like two frames or three frames a second, I can't remember, um, which was adjusted with this switch here. Also on note, it's got the pop-up flash that Canon's always had on their cameras. I don't know, I wonder when that started, but it was there back then. This is actually made of metal, so it's a very nice little camera, this. One of the interesting things about 35mm versus digital is the fact that the controls on the camera are very different. For instance, what would just be a button setting to choose your focus type, whether it's, you know, one shot or alt servo, you know. Uh, it's a whole wheel on here, which is quite amazing, really. Of course, this had autofocus. There's another huge advantage over that other camera. <laughs> so basically, that's it. Um, not a lot to really say about that one because, okay, it had its advantages over my other camera, which made it stand out a mile for me. But, but this was the end of my life as far as 35 mm was concerned because you know the digital revolution hit and the speed of being able to take digital pictures and stuff was just so much more appealing. So it was at this point that I really went serious and I spent about 1,500 pounds on lenses, uh, camera, bits and pieces, um, and the camera that I bought at the time was was this, the Canon 350D, as you can see it's got the battery grip on it because this camera is very very small and for my massive hands I absolutely needed that grip, even with that grip it's not quite enough space. Um, I can't emphasise how good a little camera this was, I mean it's only 8 million pixels, uh, it's got a small sensor on it, the autofocus was very good on it from my memory, at three frames a second, something like that. Let's have a look, put it in manual, full speed. Yeah, you know, it chugged away, but it was it was pretty good, because I used to do a lot of bird photography, um, you know, flight shots of birds, having that ability to take a few frames to get the wings in just the right position was very, very handy. I've taken some of my favourite images with this camera, and there's still some of my favourites, as I say, 8 million pixels is plenty, it, it, okay, it didn't have great ISO range and it did have noise and things, but um, yeah, it, it, for, for what it is, it's very, very good. Uh, this camera cost me at the time about three or four hundred pounds, I think. I can't remember exactly how much it cost me, because I say I bought it with a load of other stuff. And of course, still got that pop-up flash feature, 
although it's a lot taller now. Uh, but yeah, a great little camera. I can't really say anything bad against it. So I continued using the 350 for quite a while, but I always had this nagging feeling I wanted something faster, something better, something 1D-ish. Um, and I kept my eye on the Mark II that was the current camera at the time, and the prices were ridiculous. Still were when I bought one, but they were ridiculous. Um, and then the Mark III came out, and the Mark II became cheaper, and eventually I decided that I needed it enough to do it. And I bought one. In some ways it was a pretty big mistake in my life to buy it when I did, but I didn't know that at the time. Um, but without it I wouldn't have been able to achieve a lot of the things that I have achieved and the things that I've done. So if I could go back and change it, no, I don't think I would. I still would have gone and bought my baby. My beautiful, my huge and doesn't fit in the frame. Of course, it is my Canon 1D Mark II N. This camera is a beast. It is huge, but part of the advantage of that is my hand fits this thing like a glove. It's absolutely perfect. It is heavy, um, and it is expensive. This camera cost me, at the point that it was outdated and getting old, £2,000. No lens. <laughs> it was bought online, um, so I got the best deal I could. It wasn't from Hong Kong or anything, it was from the UK, but it was a brand new camera. And I can't emphasise enough how much I just adore this camera. It isn't the best camera in the world. Um, its ISO range is pretty poor. Yeah, by today's standards, definitely. Um, it's only got 8.2 million pixels, but it is a big sensor. And the quality of the image, the, the light, is just... There's just something about it. It's really nice. And just using this camera is a pleasure because it just works so well. Everything's so nicely put together. It's engineered and built in the most lovely way. But then it should be because it's a 1D camera. It can take two different types of memory cards, SDs and the compact flashes. These giant things, if you don't know what they are. <laughs> Look at that. It's one gigabyte, that card. That cost me 55 quid when I bought that. One gig. Jesus. Anyway, enough jizzing over the build quality because it is outstanding. Mm. Anyway, um, <laughs> there was a couple of main reasons that I bought this camera. One was the fact that it had 45 autofocus points, um, which for taking pictures of birds in flight makes things a whole lot easier. Um, although I still tended to use the middle three. I don't know, with, with skill and you know progression, you find that you actually don't use these features, but they're there if you need them. So the speed and accuracy of the autofocus system was one of the main things. The other thing was the frames per second, because this thing is a beast compared to the 350. Um, things are faster now, but not hugely faster. This can do eight and a half frames a second, which is something like this. And then it hits the buffer. So you can fill cards up very, very quickly when you're using one gigabyte cards. <laughs> I moved to SD, I got bigger SD cards. But yeah, it's, it's an absolute machine. Let's do that that way around, because this is always pretty to see. Can we see? Shouldn't really do that, like dust in it. Um, one of the huge disadvantages for this camera for me was the fact that it didn't have a self-cleaning sensor. It Basically that technology came in after this camera and it suffers for it. Uh, that's one of the reasons I had to learn how to clean sensors and do it myself because if I hadn't this camera would have cost me an awful lot in sensor cleaning bills. Um, but I'll get into that anyway. But yeah, so that is the camera the beauty, the one that I love the most. Until I went and bought the camera that I'm filming this with, which I can't actually show you, you'll have to look online if you want to learn more about it, it which is the Canon 600D. Uh, I will find myself more often than not if I'm walking out the door taking this with me, because for general snaps it's got lovely lovely colour reproduction, very sharp, it's got a lot more megapixels obviously, which isn't always really important but it does help you if you want to crop things a little bit especially if you're doing macro and you just want to bring it in a bit more it's a brilliant camera i can't say anything against it apart from no i can say something the autofocus system on it is slow as hell uh particularly if you're in video because then it uses a contrast based system which is even slower and you basically need black and white checkers for it to understand anything that's going on so manual focus is tends to be used a lot and the lens that I'm using on it is the kit lens which is a where are we 18 to 55 image stabilized 
It's an alright lens. I haven't got a problem with it. But I'll get onto lenses in a minute. And it only cost me about £400. And it out-trumps this thing a lot. Apart from, as I say, the autofocus system and stuff. So this still has a place for me to use. I still would use this if I was going to take flight shots of birds and stuff like that. So maybe you could compare this to the Chikati that you only take out on certain weekends, but the everyday workhorse is the 600D now, uh, which is, is kind of amazing. Although because I know the manualness of this so much better, and I just know what it's going to do. If I'm taking landscape shots and stuff like that, I am tempted to take this if I've got the time to play, basically, um, because I know what that's going to do more predictably than, than this 600. So yeah, the Casina CT4, the Canon 50E, the 350D, the uh, 1D Mark II N, and then onto the 600D. I basically just haven't got the cash to go any further forward than this, otherwise I'm sure I'd have one of the new 1D cameras. Anyway, lenses. As I was saying, the 50E came with this kit lens, which is a Canon 28 to 80, 58 millimeter objective lens. So it is a very basic kit lens, and it sounds like a kit lens because it's plasticky and loose and not great uh, <laughs> at all. But this is where I stand with these things. People get very fussy about saying that kit lenses are a load of rubbish and they're no use um, and you have to have the sort of, you know, like bought lenses are much, much better. And I don't agree quite so much. Yes, technically the, those lenses are going to be considerably better and the, lenses, the kit lenses do have flaws. But I've taken some of my favourite pictures with a, what, a 350D, which is now a very basic camera, and a lens off of a 35mm uh, <laughs> film camera. My phone's ringing. Give me a minute. Yes, I need 20 donkeys. No, you didn't need to check the order. It's quite normal. It's half of the normal monthly order. Just send them out. Fresh ones. Hey, everybody. I'm back. So, uh, what was I saying? Yeah, kit lenses. I think that they're perfectly usable most of the time. They may not be the best at doing certain things, but they can still produce damn nice, clear, sharp images. So, make of that what you will. Uh, if you disagree with me and you think kit lenses are the work of Satan, well then just don't use them. But I'm going to continue using my ancient lenses and loving the pictures from them. Okay, so you know the two kit lenses I use, the 28-80 to and the 18-55 to that came with the 600. Both of those suit all my needs generally between those two ranges of millimetres. Um, but I did need a lens for macro. So I went and bought this. This is the Sigma 105mm macro lens, uh, fixed focal length. This is a very nice lens, but it does have some problems. Um, one of them is, I think I'll put manual. There you go. Is the length of the extension for focusing. Now you can focus extremely close to things. This is true one to one, I believe. Um, basically, you can focus with this just off of the item. So, say that was there, I could quite easily focus it there. It just works. Um, obviously, if you, with my 1D, it's a lot better because it hasn't got the extra um, magnification of the fact that it's in the 600, for instance, it's using a smaller sensor, which means it's timesed a bit, you know. Um, it comes with a, a sunshade thing. But the problem with this is that if you're focusing on stuff that's close up, this actually will hit things before you're as close as you could have got. So. I don't ever use that and never have done for that reason. So the other problems with this lens is the autofocus system is slow, it is noisy, it hunts, it is rubbish. But it does work eventually. So if you're doing macro stuff and the thing's not moving, then and you're on a tripod and you're fixed and locked and everything, then it's not such a problem. Most of the video work I did for Spicy's Hidden Worlds, which was recorded with a 600D, was with this lens because I needed to get close up to things. And it worked perfectly. I'm really very happy with it. But as I say, it... It's a good lens, but it is flawed in some ways. But then it's the only macro lens I've really known. Um, I would be interested to try some other ones out, but this basically filled all my requirements, and uh, I never needed to spend money again. Um, oh, this lens cost about £300, I believe, when I bought it. I can't remember. But anyway, uh, yeah, so that's that's what I needed for macro. I would like some more macro lenses. I'd love that. Was it the MP65, is it? The Canon one? The ridiculously small lensed but very close focusing 
would be amazing. Okay, so that covers me from 18 millimeters up to 80 millimeters with a fixed at 105. And then my big, big lens. Okay, so the big boy. And I mean big boy. This has got an 86 millimeter objective lens. This is the Sigma 50 to 500 millimeters uh, APODG, again, uh, HSM. As you can see, it is very well used. This matte coating peels after a time, but only on the um, the mount, not actually on the lens. You can remove this mount by spinning it and taking it off. I don't need to do that. But this, yes, this is the lens that I use for a lot of my wildlife stuff because you need to be able to get reasonably uh, close up. When it zooms, it is a bit huge and it is quite heavy. And it doesn't have image stabilising, but I don't think that's really going to help at 500 mm um, But this this truly was the opening point for my wildlife photography to be able to get that much closer without physically getting closer myself. I mean, 500 mils isn't a huge amount of magnification, really. Um, you still have to get damned close to things, but this way you can really bring the frame in on something that's like a small bird. You can within like six, ten feet, something like that. You can really bring it down. It's internally focusing with a uh, display on the top. The autofocus on it is pretty damn quick, even though it's uh, a big lens. And when it's matched up with that 1D, it's very, very easy to take flight shots of birds. Well, comparatively easy. It's Trust me, it's a difficult thing. Anyway, uh, there is a slight thing that I'm not happy with this lens, is the amount of dust that it pulled in in its life. You can probably see, it's got a fair amount of dust in there. Um, now, that actually won't optically affect the lens itself too much. Uh, but if you did want to get it cleaned, just out of you know wanting it to, it's going to cost a hundred and something quid to have Sigma to uh, service it for you. I'm sure someone else could do it, but whether you want to take that risk with someone who might not know what they're doing. I think the dust getting drawn in is something to do with this, because you're obviously expanding the, uh, the length of the tube, which is sucking air in like crazy. It has a lock to stop it unfurling itself because it does have a slight issue as you can see so if you've got it around your neck and you forget about that it will just go on you now obviously with this lens being 50 to 500 it means i've now got everything from 18 to 500 millimeters covered and if i then use this 500 mil on say the 600d it's actually more than that i can't do the figures right now but it it's more than a 500 mil because of the magnifying effect of the small sensor but i'm going to shove it on my 1D. Just listen to this, there's nothing quite like the sound of a lens locking into a camera. Just so perfect. Now there's no question that this little rig is heavy and I did use it freehand 90% of the time. Um, just because you have to generally with wildlife because if you have it on a tripod there's no way the thing's going to sit in one place long enough. You're generally like you're jumping from here to there, you're using branches to get, get a bit of steadiness, you have to be able to move and you know track the bird and not scare it off and things like that, or whatever it might be. Um, so I did use this freehand. I'm quite a big chap, so it was never really an issue for me, um, but I know some other people that used this setup of mine and were just like, I don't understand how you use that. It's just so heavy, I can't hold it still. But, but because I can lift the weight, the heft of it actually helps steady it a bit for me. Anyway, so that's what I would use to take pictures of birds. Okay, so I'll now show you my macro setup. Basically, I use this camera. Very unlikely to have enough light available to uh, take macro shots, really close ones, without flash. So I have a Hanal Combi TF. This is a two-way trigger type thing. You can either put this end on the camera and put the base end on a flash. If you don't drop it, base end on the flash, and then when you fire the camera, the flash goes off. And equally, you can put this on the camera, attaching it with a cable, and you can use this as a button to fire the camera from over 100 metres away. Um, that thing was about 80 quid, and I'll warn you, do not buy one, because there is a major problem with this clip here, this little gold metal one, which is the retaining and connection clip for the battery. On the first one I bought of these, that snapped the first time I tried to change the battery and I wasn't being ham-fisted, I was being careful with it and it just snapped. Took it back to Jessops who very kindly replaced it, um, even though it was over a year warranty, basically because there was a known problem with those snapping. Um, so 
whatever you do, don't buy one of these because when the battery dies, you're in a risk of it breaking. Now, admittedly, the battery in this lasts for a very long time. So, in the years that I've had it, I've only had to replace the battery in this one once, but it was a scary and delicate operation to say the least. So the flash I use is a Canon 430 EX speed light. It swivels, it's a pretty basic flash, but it does everything I've ever needed it to. Um, I then shove that on here. So, see if this works. So when you fire, nothing happens. Oh, you've got to switch this on first. Doi. So when you fire, it goes off. Very handy for macro stuff. Um, I used to use ah, one of these cables, which is basically just an extension for your focus, uh, sorry, for your hot shoe for the flash. Not very good, these, I'll be honest. They tend to, uh, you have failures where it won't actually fire because this has been pulled slightly, or it will fire because this has been pulled slightly and it's bridged the connection. And, and I've had a couple of them break and uh, but doing macro with a direct flash like that is no good, seriously. So, I wanted some form of reflector, or softbox, so I made one. It's a bit of a trade secret of mine, because it's the only way I've found it possible to take good macro shots with good side lighting, soft light, very even tone, natural looking, um, but still have enough light there to take it within a couple of hundredths of a second, so you can do this freehand. Basically, this is a painter's pot. It has some <laughs> very white material on the front. This is actually some sort of sewing material, um, which is duct taped onto the front. Inside of it, it is foil lined, and it has bubble wrap in it to diffuse the light. Then this shoves in here. Might look ridiculous, but it works really, really well. And it gives you very even, of course you can't see because of the frame rate. That's why you don't always see flashes. Um, but it gives you very, very nice even tone light. I have seen soft boxes made and sold, and I think that this costing me about four pounds at most is just a thousand times better than them. <laughs> even though it doesn't fold up, that's one of the annoying things. It is a bit big, but it worked great for me. Okay, so that's the cameras, the flashes, the lenses. All that's left now is bits and pieces. This bag I have contains lots of batteries, double A's and triple A's. Have one of these handy all the time because you never know when you might need some batteries, especially for flashes. Everyone needs a dust blower. This is a rocket blower. I like this. Compressed gas, or sorry, compressed air can be very good, but I don't like the danger of squirting said stuff inside your camera. Because if the actual liquid gets onto your sensor, as I understand it, it can completely ruin it. Um, so, lens cleaning pen with brush, very basic. Cables to connect said uh, Hanal trigger. This thing is the battery pack for the, oh that's another thing actually on the 1D, the battery. It lasts forever. And there's a very good reason that it lasts forever, because it is massive. This is a standard battery for a 600D. This is the battery for a 1D, Mark 2N. It's hench, but it lasts forever, as I say, that's one of the great things about it. But yeah, this thing, uh, basically, you can plug a power cable into it, and it means you can run the 1D in, say, like a studio setting. This is a remote trigger for the 350, but it also happens to work with the 600. It doesn't work with the 1D, because whereas this costs £15, when you buy a 1D, any accessory costs you a million pounds. Like, the remote trigger on it is, like... Uh, 200 and something pounds, but then it does so many more settings. But if you just want one that just you press the button and it goes off, no, doesn't seem to be available. That very useful as a focus puller. Um, lens now, I know this isn't doing focus, this is doing zoom, but basically, if you are doing focusing, uh, particularly with digital SLR video stuff, and you want a smooth transition through the focus rather than your jerky hand, if you use one of these, which is a jar opener. Because it bends, it takes out the human uh, wobbles, so it becomes a lot, lot smoother. And that thing costs you £1.99 for a pair or something off of eBay. So, great little tip. 
but I think a lot of people know about these. In fact, I bought this from a place that was jar opener and focus puller, so they're well aware of what people are using them for. Uh, I have a couple of magnifying filters, which I'll be honest with you, I never use because they are crap. They are, I've never understood why you want to. It, you have all this camera lens that's so perfectly designed, and then you stick a magnifying filter on the end, and you end up with a horrible image generally. But maybe you found better experience than say I. I like the fact that I use quite redundant equipment, but I can still produce good images because I don't believe fully that you know if you have the best gear you're going to take the best pictures there's a lot more to it than that but there are advantages of having equipment which is physically able to do things like the autofocus and the speed and stuff like that which is why i went down the 1d range um but then as i say i was trying to do this as a career at one point and then everything went wrong um anyway continuing torch for night photography stuff this is a led lenser or a led lenser it's a p7 I can't remember how many lumens it is, but it has a couple of settings. White light, LED, battery lasts forever, brilliant little torch. Not entirely cheap, but again, worth it because it's very well made. This thing, I don't even know where this came from. This thing is ancient, but it is obviously a form of pistol grip. You can basically attach anything on there. Now, obviously that's great for things like action cameras. If you want to uh, just attach an action camera onto one with a grip. See? You can you can smooth things out a bit because you're not holding such a little thing. Anyway, the other great thing is this. Even though it has a preposterously long thread, it's like that scene in some James Bond piss take where they're unscrewing a silencer for like five minutes. Don't worry, the, the thing's going to stay there while you're doing this. <laughs> out comes some little legs. You then screw it back in. You then screw it back in, then screw it back in, and then you can do this bit a bit quicker. Very handy, little low tripod just to hold a camera, particularly handy for things like uh, with action cameras if you just want to put it on the ground somewhere. But don't know who makes it, don't know where it came from. There you go. Oh, um, if you're not a regular regular viewer of mine, I am a motor vlogger, so the cameras that I use are the drift cameras, I particularly like. This is the Ghost, which is a great camera. There is an improvement on this now, which is the Ghost S. Here's the Stealth 2 that Drift have forgotten to take back from me yet. Let's <laughs> hope they forget. But that's a, I've done a review for both these cameras, and this is what I use in all my normal videos. If you want an action camera, you can get 10% off actioncameras.co.uk using discount code I am spicy. Might as well just get that in there. But anyway, continuing, once the phone stops ringing, obviously we all need a little video camera from time to time, and I went and bought this one. Which didn't come in this case, I just bought this for like two quid in a sale at Tesco's. Uh, but this camera is about £180 and is massively overexposed. It's a Panasonic, it is a HXWA3, little handy cam, it's got a... 18 times zoom is it? Or is that the optical zoom? I'm not sure, but it's got a pretty good zoom on it. 16 mega, uh, million, pic sorry, 16 megapixels, not million, it's not quite the same. It does full HD, um, the autofocus on it is slow and useless, really is terrible. But it has got some manual settings and the other great advantage of this little camera is that it is waterproof down to 3 meters, actually submergible, as is. Um, which also means it's dustproof when I'm doing stuff on the beach. It's very handy. Uh, it's got a double lock system, the battery compartment and takes SDs. Not a bad little camera, but I would would probably not suggest buying one because of the slowness of the thing. Um, I found it to be very limiting. And the batteries for it were quite cheap because these are cheapy eBay jobs for like two quid each. Uh, this is just a polarizing filter. I don't need to explain to you what it does. If you don't know what polarising filters are, you have a lot to learn about photography. But it's very handy for digital SLR video work to try and reduce the amount of light going in the camera. As well as taking some reflections off of things like insects, which tend to be quite shiny. If you're doing them doing them very close up, doing them. Sounds wrong. Uh, anyway. What's left? This is the... AA version of the draw that goes in the 350 because you normally in the 350D with the battery grip you put two standard batteries in well if you want to go to double A's this allows you to do it but it does eat them be warned um, lens, 
sensor cleaning. Now, as I mentioned, if you go and get a sensor cleaned at a shop, it's going to cost you about 30 or 40 quid. My experience was it was I took, this was a London camera exchange, I went with my camera, I said, please, can you clean my camera? They gave it back to me, took £45 off me, and uh, yeah, what they actually ended up doing was making it worse. And I took it back to them and said, could you please clean it again for free because you've made actually left smudges on there and bits of grit. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, I'll do that. They gave it back to me. It still had smudges on it and I lost the plot and she said, you know what, forget it. So I went and bought the kit to do it myself. It's very simple. We have these individually packaged one use only little cleaning ones, which are just the right size for your sensor and a fluid. Now, this fluid cost about £17, and these cost about 20 odd something quid for 10 of them or 12 of them. So it's a quite an expensive thing to buy, but if you work out that you'd pay, say, say 30 or even £20 a time um, for someone to clean your sensor, it works out massively cheaper like this. Now, this was the days before of automatic, you know, vibrating sensors that get the dust off and stuff, but still you get grease and grit um, that you do need to get off. Uh, in the right manner, and this is the right manner. But what I would say is you need to be very careful if you can do this yourself, because if you pull any grease off of the areas surrounding the sensor and you get that on there, you're gonna get into a worse and worse nightmare and where you're probably gonna end up ruining your sensor. So it's risky, but it saves money. Uh, what's left? Oh, in a little blue bag, very handy, pop filter. Very handy for when I'm doing uh, macro stuff and I want to reflect the light from one side to the other so you get both a bit of fill light, you know. Great little thing you can just shove in your bag. And of course it is always the test of a photographer. Can you put them back together? I've heard that some studio photographers actually like just give someone who's coming, say for an assistance job, just give them a reflector and just say, fold that. And if they can't do it, they just go, you clearly aren't experienced. Go away, come back when you are. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. Um, Okay, so that's basically all the camera equipment that I use. I mean, there's not a lot more to it. Uh, the bag that I use, I'm not going to fit in a fitting shot. <laughs> but it is a Tamrac, and it is a Exploration 5. Look it up if you want to know any more. It's an okay bag. I don't like the way that it sits so high on my back, so it puts the weight right in the middle region of my back. It's very uncomfortable. Um, I really wish they would come up. So my Krieger R25 backpack for my bike when you could have a massive amount of weight in it because of the way it straps across your chest like a uh, parachute harness you don't feel the weight on your shoulders I wish they'd make camera bags like that but that thing puts the weight right in your shoulders it ruins my back so as much as it is a good bag and it's got space and dividers and stuff I don't like the way that it hangs on my back I do have a collection of photography stuff that I've never really used and I'm not really going through that there's none of it's particularly interesting there's an old Pentax camera and some stuff but I do have an old, old camera which is this, which is, I believe, from around the 50s. Got this instruction booklet and everything. Smack into the camera, why don't you? In its leather case, it looks like this. It's one of these, you know, medium format type things. I don't know exactly what they're called when they have a, a top viewfinder, but let me take it out of its case. I was given this camera um, when an elderly relative of mine died and they found it in a cupboard and they were like, you know, he loves photography stuff, give it to him. And I was very glad to receive it because it's a lovely bit of design actually. <laughs> and what can I say, it's got, I don't have to actually read this, it's got, it's got three speed settings, 75th of a second, 25th of a second and bold mode. Um, the f-stops come in at 9 and 18. <laughs> and the focus on this thing is, oh god, okay, so this is the aperture control. This is the shutter control, and this is the release. Uh, as I say, you look through here, and you can see the ceiling. See up there? That's pretty cool. That looks so clear, doesn't it? Considering this is so old, it's still pretty clear. Um, one of the interesting things about this is the fact that it's got film in it. And as you can see, I don't know what number to take, whether it's a 5, a 7, an 8, a 9 or a 10, but it has got images that were taken all that time ago that were never developed. Obviously, before someone says, oh, you shouldn't have opened it, you've ruined them now, you could have taken them and got them developed. No. Exposed film does not last forever. Um, and the background radiation of this world will bleach it very quickly. Um, so that was never going to get 
reproduced. In fact, it's degraded. It's very crispy in there. But anyway, that is one of my oldest cameras. So where are we? So look. If ever you wanted a demonstration of our technology's progression, I think that says a lot. 1950 something, mechanical, very basic. It's basically a pinhole camera, but with a few more bits on it. Film, and then the 2000s, I believe is when this camera came out. And we're at this point. It kind of says a lot. But, that still looks stylish as hell. Anyway, um, so that is all the camera equipment I'm going to show you. I've just realised there's one more thing I'm going to show you, which is, as a wildlife watcher, you need a pair of binoculars. And these are my binoculars. And if you know anything about these things, and you've just seen that name down there, you know how much these cost, or roughly. They are Leica BN 8x42s. Now, if you don't know anything about Leica as a company, they are very old and they make some of the highest quality engineered stuff, cameras and things out there. They are very expensive, but they also make very good things. They also make very good lenses. Um, these are by far and away some of the best binoculars ever made, ever. They cost me £680. I paid for them in cash. Um, my first few months of working I saved up the money and went and bought myself a really good pair of binoculars because I had a couple of hundred pound ones before that weren't great and you know things broke on them and stuff and I decided I'm always interested in wildlife and you always need binoculars for that reason so I went and bought a decent pair that should last me for the rest of my life but they truly are gorgeous and just the clarity the crispness is amazing it dusk if you look through these you actually see things brighter than with your own eyes that's how good they are at gathering light and getting it through without losing anything it incredible it really is but expensive as hell I think that covers everything there's probably loads of stuff I could have said I may have missed probably sound like a complete idiot um, Oh, tripods. I use a Manfrotto 190 Pro B with, hang on, I'll show you this one. This is the one I'm using right now with a pistol grip head. Good features with the, the neck here being able to, uh, you can take the stem out and put it sideways and these can be lifted to flat. So it's great for uh, low down work particularly and it's quite light so it's not so bad to carry around. And the other one I've got isn't even worth telling you what it is because you couldn't buy it if you wanted to probably. It's a Manfrotto uh, 36061, which is an old Manfrotto tripod. It's really, really tall, which is really handy. Um, it weighs an absolute ton, but the great advantage of it is that it was free because my brother found it in a skip. <laughs> and it served me well. So between those two tripods, always done me very well. I had a slick tripod once and it's dead. It just basically gave up the ghost thing, started rusting. It was a very nice tripod for a while, but it just couldn't cope with being out in the field day after day for years on end. Um, so there you go. That is absolutely everything as quickly as possible. Sorry about the crappy camera work, but it's very difficult <laughs> to do this with artificial lighting and different side stuff. There we go. Anyway, I will catch you all next time.
it's Sunday, I'm on a supermoto and there is a mattress. I have to do it, don't I? Well, it looks like the sunset's just not gonna happen, so maybe things <sighs> will end up being 